what motivate you to become an entrepreneur? Um, it was really about helping people and mm -hmm. coming up with solutions. And for me, it wasn't like we started a project and said, okay, you know, how is this going to be a product? Mm -hmm. It was very much of, let's have an interesting idea, a potential solution, and then let's keep doing experiments. And at some point, mm -hmm. if the experiments don't fail, you mm -hmm. need to keep doing experiments. And those experiments take you closer to the clinic. Okay. And so um, I started, I don't know, half a dozen companies or so. <laughs> seven um, companies. Seven companies. Just counted yesterday. Um, and so example, the first one was looking for a sealant or a glue to close wounds in the eye. Mm. And so we'd done all the experiments and then working with the clinician, the question was, well, how do we get this into people? Yeah. How do we see if this is really gonna work? And when you think about that, now you have a very different problem to solve. Mm -hmm. How do you build a team? How do you get the right business expertise? How do you get the right marketing people? How do you get the right manufacturing people? And then how do you build that team, raise the money, and then go forward? And so, you know, I think entrepreneurship is, is exciting and great, um, but I think it's driven by the problem. And you mm -hmm. want to be able to be moving forward a problem that you think will be useful to society. Okay. So how did you discover the problem that is worth pursuing? Yeah, sometimes that comes from myself and you're just reading and thinking and other times it comes from the clinician, mm -hmm. you know, and they say, you know, Mark, I don't want to fix um, a laceration in the eye with sutures that mm -hmm. I have to then pull out, yeah. you know, four weeks later, yeah. you know, is there a better way to do this? Mm -hmm. And so I think communicating and talking with clinicians is, is key. Okay. For anybody who uh, just started their uh, academic career, how do they, like, build a connection with the clinicians in order to, you know, to try to find more opportunities, like more yeah. interesting questions to solve. So I think that can come through like personal introductions, being mm. inquisitive, going to meetings, mm. talking, you know, all those types of things are really important to try to build those connections so you can mm. understand what problem is important to solve as opposed mm. to just a problem to solve, right? Mm. And there's a difference there. Um, and I think the other uh, challenge is really thinking about how to build the right team so that mm. you can be successful. Okay, cool. So what does the general process look like to take an innovation from bench top to bedside? <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you'll basically in the lab come up with the idea yeah. and then that'll transition to a prototype. Uh -huh. And with that prototype, you'll do a number of kind of basic studies and show that it works, for example, in vivo in a small animal model. And now to get to the next stage, um, you need to do a great deal of safety testing. Yeah. You need to think about how to manufacture it. Yeah. And you need to raise money to do all that. And you need to have the right regulatory experts. And so that's where you have to bring in a team mm -hmm. because it's really hard to do that all yourself. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way myself I could actually take an idea all the way to a product. Yeah, it's got to sure. come with people with different expertise that do it. But all of those tasks need to be done and you need to do them fairly quickly so that you can get, you know, to critical milestones in the process of, you know, did it work? Did it not work? Is it safe? You know, what are the outcomes from your first uh, clinical trial, for example? I see. So is there like a general timeline to hit this critical milestone? As soon as possible. <laughs> as soon as possible. Okay. So, you know, usually it's on the order of a few years. I see. So, you know, it's very hard to take an idea and turn it into a, a regulatory approved product in one year. So it's usually mm -hmm. a few years. A few years. Okay. You know, you don't want 10, right? But you want a few years. Okay, cool. So what is the most challenging part? during the process and then uh, how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think there are two separate challenges. I think one is on the science, engineering and biology side and that is, you know, let's say um, you've had to make changes to your prototype and now it's a slightly different design and all of a sudden it doesn't perform as well. So mm -hmm. how do you troubleshoot it? How do you determine what's different in this next version of the product that's different from your prototype? And that's mm -hmm. always the case. There's mm -hmm. always a change there that you're going to have to figure out and do. I think the second is on the business side. Mm -hmm. How do you identify, so let's say you have a sealant, for example. How do you identify which product to make first? Is mm -hmm. it a sealant for the eye? Is it a sealant for the dura? Is it yeah. a sealant for the spine? Is it a sealant for your skin? 
how do you identify the market opportunity mm -hmm. where they need a change um, such that there's a better product out there? Mm -hmm. And I think that's very difficult to do, but very, very critical. Because you can't spend three years to make something that no one wants yeah. at the end of the day. So do you just judge by the market size or how did you uh, make Market size and um, you know, competitive products. Mm -hmm. you know, how do they perform? Exactly. What are their weaknesses? What are the strengths? And, you know, or if there isn't an option, you know, mm. what's the, and then how do you introduce that if there's no competitive product there? I see. Do you have like an example for each side of the problem? Yeah, so um, for example, on the sealant side, mm -hmm. um, we have a beautiful sealant, but we have to deliver it. Mm -hmm. And the way we were delivering it um, was with a, a spray gun. So you'd spray the sealant on. And what we learned is when the clinicians used it, they wanted to spray, stop, look, and then spray some more. Okay. You can imagine if you're spraying glue, as soon as you stop spraying glue, it clogs and it no yeah. longer sprays. Yeah. And so we had to figure out, the company had to figure out, well, how do you make a device that sprays, stops, and sprays? Mm. And so that would be an example on the science side. On the business side, you know, do you think about a clinical application or a product where it's millions of applications or millions of treatments, millions of uses, or is it something that's got a thousand uses, but it's mm -hmm. higher cost? So is it mm -hmm. a more expensive product and fewer cases, mm -hmm. or is it millions of cases, but a cheaper like, okay. Margin. Product. Yeah. yeah, margins would be different. So, you know, how do you evaluate those differences when you go through the analysis? I see. Okay. I, I wonder how do people usually make that judgment? I, it's a group of people sitting around a table with, you know, the marketing person, the business development person, mm -hmm. and then, you know, figuring out uh, really what's best for the patient. And then, you know, how does that fit into the current products that are out there? Okay. Okay. So, uh, in your opinion, what makes a biotech company succeed? And then for anybody who inspire, who aspire to be an entrepreneur, uh, how can they get started to get their feet wet in the entrepreneurial space? Yeah. So I, I think the best success is, is two things. It's kind of obvious. You want good technology and great people. And I if think- If you have to pick which one is more important. Great people. I think if you have great people, you can do anything. Okay. And so if you have good technology, you can make it better. If you mm -hmm. have really bad technology, you can make it good. <laughs> but if you have good people, you can't make great people. Um, so I'm a very big fan of having really good people around the table, working hard and doing that. So you know, I think that's the challenge. I think for someone who's young and excited about doing a startup, I mm -hmm. think you know, um, you know, interacting with people who have different backgrounds. So, mm -hmm. you know, talking to people in the business school, talking to people in the med school, law schools, you know, seeing what their background is. And then just going out and working with people to start, you know, a small venture or volunteering at a company um, or doing these kind of activities where people get together and, you know, um, write code to solve some problem, you know, but just activities where people get together where you can think about that. And in college, it's fairly easy because there are yeah. entrepreneurial clubs yeah. and organizations and you should participate in those and, and you should try. So same thing for grad students. Yeah. And it's then. exactly the same thing. You know, okay. you want to uh, try to get as much experience as you can mm -hmm. just because all that helps you develop into um, a better scientist or a better business person. Very interesting. Okay. I resonate with you a lot in terms of like how to learn how to think. I think that this is pretty much the entire whole point of this project is also through like talking to you to understand how you think. And yes. hopefully we can close the mind gap between graduate students versus you. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, as an undergrad or grad student, but how do they develop, like, how to think? It comes from questioning. Mm -hmm.